<clears throat> Just give it another couple minutes. During my research month and fellowship, I started to pull this stuff with really majority of this during like, since July. July. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a new one. This is, is it a, a data set that you already been there and they just want to come in? Or I'm going to ask you to try to get the authorities from Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, Kind of, yes and no. So there's one database that's already existent, <clears throat> but it doesn't have all the information that I need, um, like diagnosis codes, and it's just like healthcare database. Mm -hmm. So then I'm also going through just like impact and using ITV2 to get the, some of the data to mm -hmm. we'll probably cross reference ITV2. Oh. Okay. And then do you, I guess, uh, at this point, you done the data collection? Mm -hmm. or you mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm working on the higher view right now, so. Um, or, okay. so okay. Do you think you're having to like, the <laughs> So I'll talk about that. I'll talk about that. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm working with other staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But. It's kind of slow, right? And yeah, as you want to do a couple of things, set, you know, like correct that. I'm saving on like um, the NSP program, mm -hmm. which is also done for CNN. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I want to ask CNN, I think it's like, you yeah. know, it's feasible. It's, yeah. I'm definitely with you. <laughs> There's a lot of different things going on. So. Mm -hmm. Are you also going to do Yes, yes. I I'm going to change my course load. <laughs> yeah. Starting. <laughs> oh, <it's a> change. <laughs> yeah. I mean, now I think I have two courses. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do that. I think you can do this. So, you know, I'm just going to tell you. Mm -hmm. I still have issues with some of the time. Right. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I have to do some of the general Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining the Friday Fellows. Um, so we have the remaining two T32 presentations that we didn't get to last week because I was very ambitious. And we also have the first of many TL1 presentations. Um, so next week, we'll try to break it up and do another presentation um, not training related. Hopefully, we'll have Dr. Knight give a conceptual models presentation, which will be good. Um, but other than that, I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. Whoever wants to hear first. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. Um, Thanks for joining us so early. Uh, my name is Matt Mefford. Um, today I'm going to be presenting um, the topic hypertension, hypertension control, and incident heart failure. Uh, so just a little bit about me. I'm a, a doctoral student in the Department of Epidemiology. I'm currently in my fifth year. I'm now officially a, doc, a PhD candidate. Uh, my research interests include cardiovascular disease treatment and outcomes epidemiology. Uh, my advisor and mentor is Dr. Emily Levitan, who's here with us today. 
Um, in addition, my uh, dissertation committee members include Dr. Levitan, uh, Paul Muttner, George Howard, Reagan Durant, and Nancy Dunlap. It's a pretty awesome committee. Yeah, <laughs> very strong. <laughs> um, so I just thought I would um, just jump into a little bit of the background and rationale for this, um, for this research. Uh, so I don't think it would surprise anybody when I say that heart failure is a leading contributor to cardiovascular disease burden. Uh, it's a continuing public health concern. Um, so uh, heart failure uh, affects approximately 6 million adults in the United States, um, and about one in nine deaths have heart failure as a contributing cause. Um, and in addition, about half of people with heart failure will die within five years of their diagnosis. And there's a high cost associated with um, heart failure care. So um, it costs approximately $30 billion each year. Um, and this includes healthcare services, medications to treat heart failure, and things like missed days of work. And it's um, additionally important to understand how cardiovascular disease risk factors and the management of these risk factors um, impact heart failure. So we know that hypertension is a main contributor to heart failure risk. Um, there are also uh, plenty of modifiable risk factors, um, including diabetes, smoking, BMI, um, et cetera. Um, and how, did the, uh, how does the maintenance or non-maintenance of all of these risk factors um, impact heart failure risk? Um, how do they interact with one another to increase the cumulative burden of heart failure risk? And additionally, the association between heart, uh, hypertension and heart failure may vary by race and separately by gender. So this is one of the main investigations for my proposed study. Um, and how do these non-modifiable risk factors uh, impact the association between hypertension and heart failure? So, for example, we know that um, hypertension tends to develop earlier in blacks compared to white individuals um, and persists longer throughout their life. Um, in addition, there's less hypertension control and things like that that, that may impact uh, their overall heart failure risk. <laughs> And so the um, cohort that I'm using to conduct these analyses is the uh, REGARDS cohort. And so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with REGARDS. It stands for the Reasons for Geographic and Racial Differences in Stroke Study. And this um, cohort is well suited to examine these associations. Um, so this is a diverse contemporary population that enrolled about 30,000 participants, um, greater than or equal to 45 years of age. At baseline, this was um, they were enrolled uh, between 2003 to 2007, and they have an um, extensive collection of blood pressure and other comorbidities, um, as well as biometric data and medication inventories that were collected during an in-home examination for these participants. So the study itself was originally designed to study excess stroke mortality in the southeastern United States and among African Americans. Um, and so because we're looking specifically at um, racial differences and then also um, we include region as a, one of our covariates, um, <clears throat> this makes us particularly well suited because blacks were oversampled um, for this study to have equal proportions of black and white participants. And about 50% um, uh, were recruited from what's known as the stroke belt and stroke buckle, which is roughly the southeastern region of the United States, um, and the remaining 50% um, from the remaining uh, contiguous United States. And in addition, heart failure outcomes have not been uh, extensively studied previously in this cohort. And the final point um, kind of gets at the last aim of my dissertation. Um, so I won't really touch on it much today, but um, <clears throat> advances in heart failure therapy may provide more treatment options in the general population reducing heart failure burden. Um, so with that, I'll jump into the specific aims of my uh, project. So the, uh, the first one and the one that I'll be talking about today is uh, to determine if racial and separately gender differences exist in the association between baseline hypertension and incident heart failure. And then um, the second aim will be to then take that a step further and look at the association between hypertension control and incident heart failure, um, looking at differences by race and gender. And then, uh, like I mentioned, the third aim um, will be to determine among those um, with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, um, uh, proportion eligible for some of these new heart failure therapies that were developed. Um, and uh, I'd like to point out that I mentioned specifically just one type of heart failure. So, um, you know, we can look at heart failure different ways just overall, but there are also um, different types of heart failure based on ejection fraction. So um, I'll describe a little bit later how we kind of categorize those as well into different types. And the main point here is that there um, are not a lot of treatment directions for those who have heart failure with pre uh, preserved ejection fraction. So that's why mainly for this, we'll focus on those with reduced ejection fraction. 
Uh, so to start this, because we're looking at the association with incident heart failure, um, I, uh, we had to construct a heart failure free cohort. So this is um, building on some previous work that was done looking at um, Medicare linked regards participants. Um, but essentially we um, created this kind of exclusion cascade to um, try to, to determine participants who potentially had heart failure when they were enrolled into the REGARD study. Um, this is using a combination of different heart failure medications and clinical indicators. Um, so um, without going into a great deal on this, essentially what we did is because we're, you know, we're looking at incident heart failure, this is a time to event analysis, so we started by excluding participants who didn't have any follow-up time, didn't have any of the um, medications or kind of uh, clinical indicators that we were needing to determine this. Um, and then we um, came up with a list of heart failure specific medications um, and different combinations of these to try to determine um, a heart failure free cohort. And so after applying all these different um, exclusions, we ended up with a population of about um, 26,000 individuals who we think potentially are heart failure free when they were enrolled um, into the REGARD study. Um, and so in addition, why is it important to construct a heart failure free cohort? So previous observational studies have attempted to examine incident heart failure, um, but they typically use a self-reported heart failure status, which isn't always necessarily reliable. Um, and in, ad in addition, there are randomized studies that have examined incident heart failure, um, which typically enroll select populations, and uh, blacks have typically been un underrepresented in these types of studies, which is another reason why REGARDS is um, good for to look at racial differences. <laughs> And uh, let's see, so why did we use heart failure medications? We also wanted to prioritize having no heart failure patients uh, to maintain a reasonably sized cohort while recognizing that there are some uh, potentials for inherent biases using these medications um, as exclusion that we can't necessarily reconcile. So with that said, I just wanted to kind of jump into some of the preliminary data that I've looked at. So these are just the baseline characteristics of the, the um, heart failure free cohort. Uh, by hypertension status. And um, essentially in the overall population, the prevalence of hypertension was about 57%. And um, just some of the main takeaways from this table, you can see that um, there were more black and female participants with hypertension in our cohort. Um, participants with hypertension tended to have higher BMI and less physical activity, so not surprising. Um, more chronic kidney disease, um, higher mean systolic and diastolic blood pressures, which makes sense. Um, in addition, they had higher uh, prevalences of comorbidities at baseline, so diabetes, history of CHD, um, LVH, um, and, and then in addition, I broke down the differences here by statin use and by um, and the amount of incident heart failure that we observed. So this table here, there's a lot of information. I'll just kind of walk you through some of the main points. So. Um, so this is looking at the association between hypertension, which is just a dichotomous outcome, yes or no, um, and this is um, between hypertension and incident heart failure broken down by race. So I, this is um, based on a COTS proportional hazards model, um, and I used progressive adjustment here. So essentially these models are sequentially adjusted for different covariates. Um, and so uh, what you can see here is that um, so I list the incidence rates in this table as well. So essentially you can see that um, among people with hypertension, there's a higher incidence rate of heart failure. Um, and uh, this is the same for both white and black individuals. Um, but what you can see here is that this association um, differs by race as well. So um, after adjusting for age and sex, as well as um, traditional cardiovascular disease risk factors, as well as some potential confounders of interest, um, among white participants, there's about a 50% um, increased risk for heart, incident heart failure associated with hypertension. And in blacks, this risk is much higher. Um, and these were statistically significant. And I've additionally done this um, because we're looking at race and gender. Uh, so these are the results by gender. So males in the top panel, females in the bottom panel. So you can see again, um, the incidence rate for heart failure is higher among those with hypertension. Uh, and this is this, um, and this is the same for both males and females. And what you can see is after adjusting for um, for all of our potential risk factors, um, there's still an increased risk associated with um, hypertension for incident heart failure, or for incident heart failure, um, and uh, in both males and females. 
And so, you know, while these are different, are they different from one another? So um, you can see here that I've just plotted these multivariable adjusted hazard ratios. Um, and, you know, it's easier to visualize them here. They do look different. Uh, when you test statistically whether they're different, you can see that by race, there was a significant interaction. Um, and by gender, not so much. So while, you know, there's an increased risk um, here by gender, and while they look different, statistically, they're not. And so, you know, hypertension is just one way that you can look at, um, you know, blood pressures. So we have the continuous blood pressure measures. So we wanted to then additionally look and see whether um, there was a continuous association. So does the um, risk of incident heart failure increase linearly with increasing systolic or diastolic blood pressures? Um, and so here you can see um, by race, I have systolic and diastolic blood pressure um, and the association with incident heart failure. And we did these in uh, about 10, in 10 millimeter mercury increases. So following the same kind of line of adjustment for um, traditional risk factors um, and some other potential confounders, you can see that at least for systolic blood pressure, there's, um, it still seems to be an increased risk associated um, with increases in those for incident hypertension. In diastolic blood pressure, um, there's a signal in the black population for a risk between increase in diastolic blood pressure and incident heart failure, and there wasn't one um, in white population. And I've additionally broken this down by gender as well. Um, so same thing here, you can see that an increase in systolic blood pressure um, is associated with um, an increased risk for incident heart failure. Um, and in diastolic blood pressure, um, these associations don't hold up. So for comparison purposes, um, you know, are these risks different from one another between race and between genders? So for systolic blood pressure, uh, the answer is no. Um, so you can look at the p-values for interaction, 0.17 for race, and 0.19 by gender. And by plotting these, you can see that they are not very different from one another. And for, but for diastolic blood pressure, um, there actually was a difference um, in the risk per increase of diastolic blood pressure for incident heart failure among uh, blacks compared to whites. And um, this association was not there are, these risks were not different from one another when looking at gender. So that's kind of the, the main analyses for these. But then there are some additional types of modeling techniques that I'm going to be looking at um, these associations. So the next steps are to get into some more advanced modeling techniques. So um, there's a what's known as the subdistribution hazards regression. So um, this is essentially looking at um, the hypertension and incident heart failure association in the presence of competing risks. And so I think generally the thought behind this is that, you know, um, somebody, if you're following somebody over time for an event of interest, they can you know, drop out of the study you know, because they left, they could die, and these all kind of take away from um, the association that you're trying to observe. So for this example, we're looking at um, this association between hypertension and heart failure. Um, and the competing risk of interest will be non-heart failure mortality. Um, and then as a final step, so I mentioned earlier that um, you know, we're going to be looking at different types of heart failure. Um, and so the last component of this will be what's um, known as cause-specific hazard regression. And this is essentially um, you know, taking all of those incident heart failure cases that we have um, classifying them based on ejection fractions um, into the types of heart failure, and then looking at the differential association of hypertension and heart failure subtypes. So, um, you know, while we may see one association between hypertension and heart an overall heart failure, um, hypertension may differ differentially um, impact the risk of having these different types of heart failure. And so those are my next steps for for the project, and that's kind of all I had today. I didn't want to overload you with a lot of data from some of the some of the modeling that I've already done with these. Um, but with that, I'll kind of open it up to questions and comments that anybody may have. Okay. Yes. That's really it's really interesting. Well done. Um, so what are your thoughts on, or have your committee helped you out through the time component in terms of 
how much of an impact is, is the association of hypertension continue, like is the effects the same over time over your follow-up period or is there going to be sort of like a spike risk at the beginning that you're going to account for? Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, part of the preliminary investigations of this data is to look at um, how, how these associations behave over time. Mm -hmm. um, so we've done some formal testing with um, interactions with time to see if the association varies and it doesn't. So it seems like there's it's a pretty constant. consistent risk yeah, that we've seen here. So we just um, chose for the purposes of this to model time continuously. Mm -hmm. um, but if it wasn't, if, you know, if it looked like that, we could, there, was, there are other techniques that we could use. We could split the data based on time periods and things like that. Yes. I have a question. I came in late, so I apologize if I through this. But for the competing risk, are you trying to understand if you're more likely to develop heart failure or die of heart failure or die with heart failure, is that what you're trying to look at? Uh, so I may defer to, to Dr. Levitan on this. Um, I'm just competing risks is one of those kind of newer things for me that I'm still learning the nuances of, but um, yeah, it's a good question. So the standard Cox model and, and Kaplan Myers and everything else sort of assume that if you die, if the person dies, um, before they have the event of interest, that their risk of having that event is the same as the people who stayed at your study, right? Which on the face of it is kind of a silly assumption. Um, and so what the competing, what that subdistribution hazard model does is it essentially says, okay, once somebody dies, the risk of heart failure thereafter is zero. Um, so um, that that's essentially the, the technique. So what you're just trying to do is say, you know, what what happens when instead of saying someone is keeping people in your sort of risk pool mm -hmm. and assuming that their risk is, is, is sort of the same as the people who are you know, still in the study, uh, what happens if you say, okay, once you die, your risk is not zero. So are you going to be able to try to talk about death from mm -hmm. versus just with heart failure or just death? So, so do you want to back question right then? Yeah, so I mean, we, um, the competing risk of death is actually non-heart failure, <coughs> really okay. mortality. Okay, gotcha. And with those different models, with the cause specific, it's more like the etiology of disease, so you're more looking at like the causes, and the sub-distribution is more like risk factors, um, because you keep people in the risk pool. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like weighting them, whether they're, if they're still in the risk pool, they're still there. So you may end up, if there's a lot of death in your study, you may have very different cost specific and sub-distribution. If you don't have a lot of death, then they may look the same. Is that right? Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do you want to talk about, because we looked at these yesterday. Yeah. So um, so the sub-distribution hazards are pretty similar to the overall Cox regression that we performed. Um, the cost specific hazards were actually much higher than I was anticipating. Yeah, well, because you take you end up taking out. Right. But when you're comparing the, the Cox and the, the subdistribution, right? When you're Those are the same, the regular Cox. Yeah, yeah, there yeah, really weren't any differences. Yes, this is, this is great. I've got a much, I think, more basic question. In terms of regards and data capture, mm -hmm. is it an interval cohort where folks come in like every six months and get data capture or a clinical cohort where you're kind of collating clinical data. Just thinking about the implications of some of that in terms of case of, you know, identifying time to event, how is incident heart failure identified? Just the implications of data capture on that precision. So I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's about every six months they follow up with participants and um, kind of screen for if they've had any hospitalizations, which may kind of trigger them to go and investigate a little further to see, you know, what those hospitalizations entail, and then also they collect just general, um, general information from the participants. And is there medical record in terms of case identification? So there's some sort of abstraction. So in terms of cases, are they anchored to that visit date, or if you have documentation of within the last six months? They were diagnosed on this date. How, how, in terms of the signing, when did someone become an incident? Yeah. Partner? So they. So they. Um, so when they abstract the medical records, they actually um, have the actual like admission dates and discharge dates for these individuals. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the other thing, just thinking about implications and inference. So if I'm understanding, you know, 
the impact of hypertension on incident heart failure over this you know, relatively short follow-up period differs by race and differs by sex, and it's not necessarily explained by differential controlled blood pressure, or maybe modestly with diastolic, but even those effects were pretty modest, and you control for a bunch of things. So the inference being yeah. there's some other well, yeah, yeah, behavioral, so, biological, unmeasured factor that's explaining why hypertension behaves differently in one group versus another? Well, I think the point is to try to control for as many potential risk factors and encounters as possible to look at just what that general association is by by race and by gender. Um, but you know, the second component of this will be to look then at the association with hypertension control specifically um, to see to see how that impacts high, uh, heart failure risk. Now, how, so doing that differently than what you showed us with the with the association between. Uh, so well, these, no, so the, it'll be essentially using the same the same types of models to look at the association there. I think if that's the case where differential control isn't explaining it, you control for all these other behavioral factors, mm -hmm. it raises really interesting questions in terms of unmeasured, modifiable behavioral or biological factors that might explain these differences. Yeah, yeah, I think, so. um, and that's the hope is that <laughs> that we can we can find some of those interesting conclusions. Yeah. So um, the similar things we've been seeing for stroke, um, which are not fully explained. One of the thoughts is sort of the duration of blood of hypertension. So if people are developing hypertension, you know, younger, if you're capturing the right. 45 or 45 and older. So yeah, we're going to try and figure that out. Yeah, that's similar thoughts thinking about, you know, because we, we capture folks, but you have all this history that precedes that might influence. But even thinking, I mean, biologically, and I don't know, I, I don't treat heart failure as much, but um, Treatment historically even differed by race in terms of medications being more effective. So it also speaks to this idea of thinking about the earlier steps in translation. Are there biological mechanisms that might contribute? You know, just some interesting questions that we might feed back to the folks in the lab. Yeah. Yes. You may have said this, and I don't know if it's in regards. Um, there's a pretty interesting literature around perceived discrimination and hypertension. Um, and it seems like that might be something that would be really relevant to your study. Is that something that you can look at in regards? So there are some uh, psychosocial factors that we can look at. Um, I don't think that there's a perceived discrimination variable or anything that kind of gets at that. We do have things about like perceived stress, um, depressive symptoms, and, and we control for some of those in our models. So they, they didn't collect that until the second annual visit, which is 10 years later, so... Do they have lifetime? As well, because lifetime turns out to be the one that's more relevant anyway in most of the, I think, in most of the outcome studies, so... And that's not something that's as time dependent. So if you ask it now, it's still relevant. I think most of the scales have two components, or many of them. Yeah. Somebody else speak up if they know better than me. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a couple of different are there, is there any uh, questions on diet collected on this? There is diet data um, okay. in regards. Um, you know, for, so I can't remember specifically. I don't deal a lot with the diet data, only um, just because it, it tends to get a little messy. So um, in terms of you know, reliability of reporting on diet data, um, you know, I, I can sometimes I can't remember what I ate last week, so you know having <laughs> people try to recall, you know, over a certain amount. Capture like what is their what are their what are their habits? I mean, what what are the regular diet on the regular diet or their uh, vegetarian diet? Or I don't know what that question is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Why is it messy? Like, what is messy like? Uh, um, what's messy about it? Um, what's messy about it? So you, you, these questionnaires have something like 100 questions, and they say, okay, over the last year, um, how often did you eat berries? Right. Uh, okay. And um, okay. you know, and it's a whole, it's a series of like 100 of those kinds of questions. People are not necessarily very reliable. Some of the things you really care about, particularly you know, for heart failure, you want to know about sodium. And the free frequency questionnaires tell you like nothing about sodium because uh, most of it comes in packaged foods and it varies from brand to brand. And it, it's just a. It, I mean, you can you can do it. There's some information there, but um, uh, yeah, it's it's a little question. You have to be a little careful. 
Yes. Click the little orange. You have a question from. Oh, nice. Great. 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 Good job, Eve. Yes. <laughs> 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 switching gears a little bit to palliative care. Um, so I'm Sandhya Amadumbi, I'm one of the postdoc T32 fellows, um, and so I'll be talking about what I've done so far in the brief uh, three to four months that I've been a fellow. Um, and my focus is in uh, palliative care and end-stage liver disease. So a little bit about me, so I've been in Birmingham since 2013. I started residency here in internal medicine back then. Um, and actually during residency, a lot of my research was focused on liver disease and outcomes, specifically looking at the progression of uh, fibrosis to cirrhosis and development of complications like SVP. Um, so then after some experiences in residency, I decided to pursue a fellowship in hospice and palliative medicine. So I just finished that this past um, June and then um, started the postdoc T32 fellowship. Um, so my primary mentors are Cynthia Brown and Marie Bakaitis um, in the Division of Geriatrics, Gerontology, and Palliative Care. Um, and then so 80% of my time is with training and research, and then 20% of my time what I'm doing is um, doing outpatient palliative care in the supportive care clinic in Kirkland Clinic. Um, and my focus there is on non-malignant diseases, especially liver disease. And what I hope to do over the next two years is create an embedded palliative care clinic in Cirrhosis Clinic. Okay, so I'll just dive right in into the problem. So there's about 400,000 patients with cirrhosis in the U.S. and then only about six to 7,000 transplants are performed annually. So, and then typically there's about 17,000 folks on the waiting list for liver transplant. Um, and then mo more recently, some data has shown that the number of patients that are delisted has actually doubled from 2009 to 2011. So what this leaves us with is that there's a large proportion of patients that don't get transplanted. And transplant is the only cure for cirrhosis, um, as well as some HCC as well, which is hepatocellular carcinoma. And so this leaves a large population with palliative care needs. And so what I mean by that is they have a lot of symptoms and also advanced care planning needs because as cirrhosis progresses, they develop complications and they die of their liver disease. And so there has been some studies, um, some national studies and some uh, single center studies that show that the rate of utilization of palliative care is between 4.5 and that's the national study and then um, and varies from 4.5 to 34.4%. And that is a single center study that was done. So um, I wanted to sort of give you all a big picture of what I plan to do for the next two years. And so um, I started off during fellowship during a research month. Um, I wanted to dive into the literature, get a sense of what's out there in terms of palliative care for liver disease. Um, and then what I'm working on now is a retrospective study, just working on planning and design for that. And then I plan to go into a qualitative study to understand some of the barriers and facilitators for palliative care in, in this population. And then down the line, intervention development. So I started off with a review. So um, I don't know if anybody's heard of a rapid review before, um, but basically I had heard of this methodology from Elaine Markland um, in the Jerry Division. Um, and my goal here was basically I wanted to take a deep dive into the literature and not get caught up in the methodology. <laughs> so I did not want to do a systematic review. I wanted to have a, a, a comprehensive literature search, um, you know, know what's out there and potentially have a presentable and publishable product out of it. Um, and then, you know, if I didn't get published, it was okay with me because this was something I wanted to do anyway. Um, so my research question here with the rapid review was that in patients with end-stage liver disease and hepatocellular carcinoma, 
what is the evidence for palliative care and hospice interventions compared to patients who do not receive palliative care or hospice? So I wanted to go over some differences. Um, since this is a relatively new methodology, people may wonder, well, why don't you just do a systematic review? Um, so here's this, so this is a slide set I got from a rapid review summit um, that was publicly available. Um, and so you know the stuff that's crossed out in red is basically what you don't have to do in a rapid review compared to a systematic review. So typically when you get started off with a review, um, you have to register it on Prospero which is an international registry of systematic reviews. So before you get started, put all this work into it, make sure that nobody else is doing what you're doing. Uh, and you also, once you register it, you're technically you know, the person that's doing that review. And so other people doing the reviews will know that, oh, there's somebody already doing this. Um, and so um, sometimes for systematic reviews, they say that it does have to be published in a systematic review journal, which I know isn't always the case. But so for a rapid review, you don't have to do that. Um, so then there is a comprehensive and systematic literature search. So typically for a systematic review, they say you have to do at least six databases. So for a rapid review, typically it's anywhere between one and three databases. So then um, you do have predefined inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then you also have to do a risk of bias um, appraisal. You don't have to do reporting harms, which is typically done in a systematic review. And then, so the next thing is, um, sometimes in a systematic review, you also do a meta-analysis. And so you don't have to do that in a rapid review. So basically, you can just do a descriptive summary of the studies you found um, and don't have to necessarily synthesize all of that. So then lastly, um, so for a systematic review, usually each step, including starting from the search to screening, to looking at eligibility, synthesizing data, all of that has to be done independently by two reviewers. And so that was the step that I just was not willing to do. <laughs> um, and so in a rapid review, it's just one reviewer can do all of the. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just yeah. wanted to go, before we leave your question, HCC is a requirement. I'm curious why you require HCC, because I think initially you talked about in stage liver disease in general. Correct. So, so there's no broad definition, actually, for end stage liver disease. Okay. And typically when it's mentioned, mentioned in literature, what people mean is that it's, it's the last year of life for liver disease. And so, um, you know, I did actually initially start off wanting to look at non-malignant cirrhosis and liver disease. Um, but then what I realized, so is HCC is actually a complication of cirrhosis. And it's most often in the setting of chronic liver disease. And so it's hard to sort of separate that out as a population. So I actually started off with my question with non-malignant, just decompensated okay. cirrhosis, and I had to go back and, and sort of redo the search, actually, including HCC. It's just cleaner to study that, is that what you're... I think so. Okay. Um, I think it's just hard to separate, because it is a complication of liver disease, and so it'd be hard to take out that population. I just don't think you'd be capturing what is important and relevant for this population if you take that out. Thanks. And HCC for the non-clinicians mean? Hepatocellular carcinoma. Yeah, so it's considered a complication of cirrhosis. Yeah. Can I just make one mm -hmm. or two small comments? Sure. Just for consideration. So probably what you're doing is really close to a systematic review mm -hmm. anyway. And one of the things that I've noticed about doing um, reviews in the area where a lot of it's kind of qualitative and the measures are murky and um, the studies really differ mm -hmm. as opposed to like clinical trial where you're looking at an effect right. size of different mm -hmm. drugs and you really, to me, those systematic reviews, you know, usually portend a meta-analysis and there's all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff you got to do. With the topic that you're looking at, mm -hmm. um, it's likely you wouldn't be able to do a meta-analysis anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's highly likely you would be able to say we did a systematic review without having to do the meta-analysis piece anyway. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm saying is you could almost describe it in the, with the rigor that you're probably going to use anyway and still have right. a systematic review. And the only thing you would have to do is find some student who really wants to look at abstracts and get their name on the paper to finish out that second piece. So I just, I wonder if you would be limited where you could publish it 
Mm -hmm. If you can't say that it's a systematic review, and I'm not sure, you would have to do that much more. Mm -hmm. So it's just something to consider. Yeah, and the, that is certainly a question that I've, I've really struggled <laughs> with because, yeah. you know, I really thought in the beginning that, um, I mean, I, I just happened to get lucky with a team where we actually did a more comprehensive approach for the rapid review. Yeah, um, I mean, it sounds like you're all pretty much doing a systematic review. Yes, Always. mostly. Only that, you know, we just had, actually, we split up everything between different reviewers, and so each step was not done by two separate reviewers. And so um, so I'll, I'll go through some of the sort of the timeline and what we've sure. done, but this is definitely something I've struggled with, mm -hmm. um, especially as we're getting close to submitting now, um, writing it, writing the paper and submitting it. Um, I guess for me what the difference was was that um, – I just am not willing to, you know, my main goal here is just to get some sort of publication sure. out of this. Okay. And so, you know, I'm, I'm sort of on a timeline also. And so that's actually why I chose this in the first place. And it's something that I've certainly struggled with because okay. I'm like, well, if I'm doing all this, why don't I just, yeah. um, and so, and so we'll see. Um, we're getting to that. I yes, absolutely. Into <laughs> yeah. So. Our inclusion criteria, um, adults with end-stage liver disease who underwent palliative care or hospice interventions. And then, like I said, we actually went back and added HCC. And so that was a big delay, actually, because I started off, you know, got the results, went through the screening in a month. And then after we started realizing, oh, we got to include this population, then we had to redo the search and sort of do that whole process again. Um, and then we did uh, initially want to include um, studies where ESLD or HCC was not the primary diagnosis if they designate how many patients had ESLD or HCC, just because we hypothesized that there wouldn't be a lot of literature on this, so we wanted to be inclusive. And then excluded articles that are not in English. If they said, um, sometimes they'll say things like palliative taste, transarterial chemoembolization, um, and so that would often come up, but we excluded any sort of procedural interventions because what we're interested in is sort of palliative care provider interventions, um, and then pharmacological interventions along the same line. And then if they included systemic disease, so something like sarcoidosis with liver involvement, that was not necessarily the population we're interested in. And then same thing with a, a, another primary malignancy with METs to the liver. And then also excluded radiation and chemotherapy. So, um, so I actually started this in January. <laughs> um, so we started off with a total of 2,466 results from six databases. Um, so then we did the initial screening. So like I said, you know, when I first started out, um, we had two reviewers and we split it up equally, like a thousand each. Um, and we actually finished that pretty quickly. It was about two weeks where we finished that. Um, and so, um, so then we got through the screening process, excluded a bunch of articles, got to the full text, and then you see this big delay, and that was just because I was in clinical fellowship and so just didn't have time. And then so once I started um, this fellowship, um, was able to start the full text article review, and then more in depth when we looked at eligibility, ended up excluding about 11, and then got to eight articles. And so we did a backup review or risk of bias assessment of these eight articles. Um, yeah, and so, you know, part of the part of the thing here was that I, I did have a team of about five people that I started with, but um, or five people total, but there were some people that, you know, helped with initial screening and then some people that helped me with, you know, full text review and things like that. And so that was sort of the part where, you know, the distinction between the systematic and rapid reviews just I just had moving parts. And so I was I was the only person sort of doing everything. Um, yeah. So um, so these are my results. Um, just an overview of the included studies. So we had about eight or we didn't have eight studies. Um, so as you can see, most of them were retrospective cohort studies. And uh, majority of them actually ended up with hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer where they didn't des designate that it was HCC. Um, and so, you know, if we had just looked at non-malignant disease, we would have had nothing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in retrospect, I guess I'm glad we included that population as well, just for the results. Um, and then most, or it was about half and half between hospice um, intervention and palliative care <laughs> intervention. Um, so then, as you can see here, um, uh, 
wide degree of variability in terms of sample sizes. Um, and then also looking at the setting of the intervention, it's, it's really a, a mix of inpatient, outpatient, or both. And, you know, some, you know, some one of them just didn't even designate where the setting of the intervention was. Okay, so then um, one of the really helpful things with this review was helping me to understand what kinds of outcomes do people look at in palliative care. So that, that was something I didn't even have a great understanding of before in research. And so the most common thing that people looked at that I say is HRU here is healthcare resource utilization. So cost, ER admissions, hospitalizations, things like that. So that was the most common thing people looked at. And then um, what I say is CEOL is characteristics of end of life. So some people call it quality of death. Um, which, you know, there is an assumption that, um, you know, dying at home and things like that is better. So I didn't want to necessarily make that assumption here. So I just call it characteristics of end of life. So do they tell you if patients died in the hospital, at home, et cetera. Um, and then the other thing that I included in there was things like code status. Were they DNR? Um, do they have advanced directives? Was the actual care concordant with their advanced directives? Things like that. And then, so the other thing that people looked at, PRO, there was only one study that's patient reported outcomes, things like symptom uh, improvement, things like that. And then also survival, one study looked at survival. Um, so then, um, basically, um, then we did a risk of bias assessment. As you can tell, just with even the study designs, um, there was a high risk of bias. Um, and so the tool that we used was the, uh, there's a published NIH tool for retrospective cohort studies. And then I did have one quality improvement study and a prospective cohort study. So for the quality improvement study, um, there's, a, there's a tool you can use called the minimum quality criteria for quality improvement projects. So that's what I use. Um, but, you know, as you can tell, there's, you know, most of the studies have a high risk of bias. Okay, so any questions about that? Mm -hmm. um, what, what was causing the high risk of bias? So it was things like not addressing confounding, um, just, yeah, that was the most common thing that I used as, um, for that, so. Anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, not a question, more just a comment. Um, I know that Rebecca Drum, who's not here yet, has met with the Lister Hill folks about mm -hmm. software they had or maybe that could be purchased. So for anybody in the room that's looking at doing a review and maybe doesn't have as much help, I believe Lister Hill either has software or has in the past used software that will pull all your studies. And I think does a lot of this, does a lot of the legwork that we do using algorithms. Um, hmm. And she may be someone, you know, I'm happy to put you in touch with her if you're curious how that works. I don't think she ended up using it. You remember, she, I don't think she ended up using it, but like, no. And I think that the library folks in particular are helping with the syntax even. So, you know, they're really helpful. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, so I, I definitely had the librarians help me with the really, search terms yeah, and things and like wonderful. that. Yeah, and they're wonderful. I mean, they're, they're mm -hmm. really helpful. So if you're thinking about doing this, it's mm -hmm. definitely worthwhile very early on yes. seeking someone out. We can help you connect with someone. I know, um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what with the software, and, and but I know in terms of the syntax, there, there's such, certainly so many mm -hmm. little details and nuances mm -hmm. that if you don't, it's your first time doing it, that they just right. know and yes. they're incredibly helpful as a resource. Yes, absolutely. That was the first, you know, group that I contacted and um, they absolutely helped a lot with searching and, and one of them is actually helping us with authoring too, like some of the methods yeah. that, you know, how they searched and things like that. That's a really so, nice synergy for them because it, it works out really well. Um, yeah. I was just thinking about this though, yeah. again, having not, not done like hospital medicine in a long time, it sounds like there's a real gap. I mean, it, yes. except for the pedicellular carcinoma, just mm -hmm. remembering mm -hmm. the symptom. I mean, like end stage right. liver disease is one of the most just challenging. Yes. You know, absolutely morbid. population. And so it just mm -hmm. seems like from the, the the rapid review. Yes. Really, there hasn't been much focus except for those that progress to HCC, which is mm -hmm. a relative minority of yes. folks of, of the larger population of cirrhosis. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that was sort of my hypothesis, and also my intent in doing this is you know sort of making the case for sort of the yeah. next steps here. So. Nice one, mm -hmm. validated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I wrestle with that same kind of, it's a good problem to have, right? But there are so much, there's such, yeah, Little, or need mm -hmm, yeah. for, for 
palliative interventions to improve quality of life for mm -hmm. this population. Mm -hmm. There's even more than, even fewer people get it, it seems like, than COPD, which is a couple, 2% of you know, right. patients with end-stage COPD get it. So maybe Emily, you might want to comment, how do you reconcile not having a large population to study for things like retrospective cohort studies that you might have 100 people or less at, at one institution that might get value of care, um, even in the tens <laughs> that get, get something like that, unless you went back for years and years and sort of built up a large data set. How do you sort of look into this question with such a small number for, for power, for, for some making a claim that it can improve Mm -hmm. retrospectively without designing you know, your own prospective set. Um, I think that the um, sort of the standards are uh, in terms of power and control for confounding tend to be lower sort of the first time someone looks at something. Right. You know, if you're like good math study, like looking at hypertension and, and heart failure, right? So we're not going to get away with a study where we have like <laughs> 50 cases of heart failure, the best job to make this an impactful paper. Um, if you're looking at something where you know it's really kind of wide open, um, there's a lot more sort of leeway in terms of uh, you know, like, okay, yeah, it's a little underpowered, but you see something that looks like a big effect, like that's something we're pursuing. Okay. Um, so not to not not that the design is important, but that you need you know there's the limitations are, are yeah, that, that's what we're that's where she mm -hmm. seems to be and we're at that sort of like mm -hmm. I need to ask this question about does that it improve their readmissions, does right. it reduce their healthcare utilization? And but there's not that many who get it. There's hardly anybody who gets it. It might even be that the numbers are so small that it's preliminary data in the grant that's not publishable as a manuscript. You know, you know, because there is such a dearth, it might be mm -hmm. the real value is just defining what a gap there is as the reason and the need to do the prospective study. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you have so few folks exposed yeah. to the that's intervention, it. you can see a paragraph, you know, but the idea that it just might be that it's just something that you do to have as preliminary data, but it's not mm -hmm. publishable because you have such a small exposure and there's probably a lot of bias in who that 2% is to try to draw inference that, you know, the 2% that got the intervention extrapolates to the 98%, you know. Um, I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's tough. Um, but actually, kind of going into that, um, well, let me start here, but basically, what my next step is doing a single center retrospective cohort study here at UAB. Um, so UAB, just some background. Um, the transplant center here has been in existence since 1996. I think we've done over 2,000 transplants, about 50 per year. Um, and then our palliative care center has been in existence since early 2000s. Um, and so we actually have a database um, of all the palliative care consultations, both inpatient and outpatient. Um, since uh, early 2000s, basically. Um, and so, you know, we already know that there's low utilization, but actually a lot of these studies, what they looked at were only patients that died or delisted. And so part of what I'm trying to do here is look at what is the ideal timing of the intervention as well. Is it just only in the last month of life when they are delisted? Or, you know, could it potentially be further upstream? Um, you know, when they are even listed for transplant or when they start having decompensated cirrhosis where they start developing complications and things like that. And so I wanted to look at it a little bit broadly. So then um, starting off there, um, my first aim for this study is to examine the rate of utilization of palliative care and hospice in adult patients with ESLD, including HCC, um, at UAB compared with patients who have non-HCC malignancies. Um, and just to give you all a, an estimate, so basically right now for cancer, where palliative care is actually probably the most established in terms of a diagnosis, um, the rate of utilization there is only 50%. So you'd think it's a little bit higher where, you know, it's something where it's more established, but it's about 50%. So that, that's kind of um, the, the national data. And so that's what I would be comparing with. Um, any comments on that? This is still stuff I'm working on, so I'd love feedback. I guess I would say, do you need a comparison group? I mean, it's, um, a, it's a descriptive study. I mean, because yeah. and even, even stratifying, I mean, when you lump together mm -hmm. ESLD I with mean, HCC, with HCC mm -hmm. you'd think there's going to be, that's a heterogeneous group. Um, yeah. 
So I, I just don't know, for me, this is really uncharted territory, and you're looking at earlier right. than most folks have Dwayne looked Benita. at, most have waited until mm -hmm. the delisted, is a relatively simple descriptive yeah. study looking at yeah. referral utilization and factors associated with sufficient at this stage. I don't know, yeah. I'd be kind of curious about that. That's what I just thought it would like be. Lung cancer, mm -hmm. for instance, the rate of, uh, of palliative care use, is, it's actually pretty high. Yeah. But yeah. it's dramatically lower in somebody that has chronic lung disease who's equally asymptomatic, whether it's fibrosis or... Right, that to me, I think, comes maybe the challenge with the comparator is... Including the HCC it, here. Well, and even then, it's malignancy. So, because I would think it would be COPD, mm -hmm. some gold stage COPD without mm -hmm. necessarily lung cancer. I think once you bring in cancer, mm -hmm. the cancer is a big trigger for referral to palliative and hospice care. Right. So it also has to do with when they get reimbursed. So what are they allowed to reimburse for this palliative care? At any point. Um, anytime there's a consultation. Is that what you mean? Like for the yeah. providers? Yeah. Like I, I know. There's no, there's no, um, it doesn't matter when in the disease process. So, you know, at any point when palliative care gets involved with a full encounter, you, you can get reimbursed. Mm -hmm. Hospice is different. Hospice is typically reserved for the last six months of life. Okay. And so palliative care, um, you know, at any point in the disease process. Mm -hmm. I would just think that if there really is such a dearth of knowledge in the field that considering starting with a more descriptive study in the universe mm -hmm. of people meeting the, mm -hmm. you know, well-defined criteria for ESLD and then further stratified by HCC, mm -hmm. um, just to consider that. Um, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so uh, well, I was actually mm -hmm. going to say the same thing. I, I, it seems to me it depends a little bit upon what your what your core question is. Yes. And your question is, in this set, this group of people, how much difference does palliative care make mm -hmm. on utilization? Mm -hmm. The extrapolation to these other groups might be interesting, but mm -hmm. might create a lot more of a workload and mm -hmm. might not really get at the question you're asking. To yeah. set yourself up for your next study. Um, I mean, it would be interesting, but I think it yeah. would be a lot more data that you'd have to deal with. Yeah, so, so my overall question is about just for this population. Um, and what I just to clarify that what I mean here by utilization is how often or, or, you know, what's the rate of palliative care and hospice being utilized, not healthcare resource utilization. That'll, that's another right. thing that I have. Um, but yeah, so. I mean, I agree. I just thought, um, you know, it'd be interesting to compare to what the standard is for palliative care, which, which is cancer, um, all cancers in general. Um, where even that, the rate of utilization is, you know, not as high as you'd think. It's about 50% nationally. Um, but mm -hmm. when, when, you start, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. when you start thinking about non-HCC malignancy, I mean, that's everybody from like early stage breast cancer to end stage. <coughs> Yes, um, it's a it's a it's big cohort of so, people. So yes, I think, um, it may be too I much to. That. Yeah, I, I think that that's you know such a broad comparator. Yeah, I'm sure it gives you much. Enough. Yeah, and that's a good point. Mm -hmm. It might be nice down the road. I mean, so I always think about. I love the idea of doing the review first. So I think just yes. sequentially doing the review first, mm -hmm. publishable, ideal. Mm -hmm. If there's really a knowledge gap, I think a simple descriptive study because it's just easier to do, to do. And, and, and you can get it published. It might not get published it's in as high profile as a journal, yeah. mm -hmm. but it sets the stage and makes you out there as not defining mm -hmm. how big of a problem this is. So immediately right. you so are identified as someone, and then down the road you think about the nuance of the once you bring in the comparison Comparing, group, yeah. defining them, and it's yeah. so much more complexity just mm -hmm. time. Um, and you'll Intent. do this study, but it might just be you do the study in a couple of years. Right. Right. Um, and actually, so I've already sort of preliminarily, um, you know, have some data here, meaning I just used I2B2 and I asked some of the I2B2 people to, hey, can you have, just help me find liver disease and the palliative care consult order and the diagnosis code that people usually enter for palliative care orders for hospice. So they gave me from 2010 to 2017, there were 643 patients and this is inpatient and outpatient. So I already kind of have that. Um, I just didn't know if I needed to, you know, add a comparison group, but I think, you know, I agree with you that probably simplifying it is better. And correlates. So. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. even a simple yeah. analysis of, you know, dichotomous right. referral, not referral, yeah. and one of the correlates. Yeah. And down the road, you can work with, on a paper with a non non Right. <laughs> you can get COPD. <laughs> right. COPD yes. versus the SLD. Um, yes. Yeah. So then my, my next aim is to, you know, in that population, determine if there's any demographic or clinical characteristics that impact receipt of palliative care and hospice in this population. Um, and then lastly, looking at outcomes here. And so um, 
determine the impact of these interventions um, compared to patients who don't get it. And so I'd have to figure out how to get a matched uh, cohort of people that didn't get palliative care or hospice and compare, you know, healthcare resource utilization, things like ER visits, hospitalizations, procedures, um, characteristics of end of life care. And so again, what, you know, a question that I wanted to ask that is different from previous studies is, does it impact the receipt of transplant um, and also survival? Looking at that. So that was kind of all I had. So I already mentioned that, you know, I looked at ITV2. Mm -hmm. One thing to consider would be, um, and you may have enough, I don't know what, mm -hmm. you said 600, I forgot. What yes, 643. Mm -hmm. Is the total number of patients with end stage liver disease? No, no. So, so I that's think the, one the total is around 10,000. Yeah. yeah, 643 is with palliative care. So that was, you know, that's what I was going to tell you is that it was actually a lot higher than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I don't know if, okay. you know, it's and more recently or what, but... Um, so 643 of 10,000... Of 10,000 patients. patients. Yeah, and it's... So that's... It's difficult to identify in-stage liver disease, like I said, um, but um, I just looked at all liver disease. So all the diagnosis codes for liver disease um, from ICD-9 coding, and then looking at the palliative care consult order, um, hospice orders... Um, and then the diagnosis code, code for palliative care. This is inpatient and outpatient. Um, and so like I said, there's also a palliative care database. And so what I'm planning to do is um, look from 2012 to 2017 um, and um, sort of cross-reference with the palliative care database. And the holdup here is that the palliative care database only has palliative care consults, so not any hospice um, patients. And then in addition, they don't have IC, like a comprehensive list of ICD-9 codes right now. So that's sort of the hold up there to um, sort of get that data. Um, I think they just have the top five. And so, you know, you wouldn't necessarily capture all the patients with liver disease. How yeah. often do you, just being a clinician, I usually go through palliative care. Don't you think most people go through palliative care before they get a hospice? Um, no, not always. Really? Okay. Mm, no. Um, so in, on the inpatient side, you know, a lot of times hospice is just done by the social worker. So if you as a clinician think they have a prognosis of less than six months, you can just get the social worker to make referrals and um, they can go directly to hospice from there. Mm -hmm. And outpatient they get is like drug drugs. The hospice folks come to Right. Uh, wow. Yeah, like in oncology, I mean, we, you know, there's a, there's a lot of patients that just go directly to hospice wow. from the oncologists okay. and not So then you may do care. things in folks that in your name. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, for just in case you want to investigate those 643 patients a little mm -hmm. further, I know an ITV2 that you can like certainly narrow down your criteria so there are different age criteria you can mm -hmm. apply. Um, they can also be break down by uh, race and sex as well. So yes. So, actually, they, um, you know, since it is de identified, they actually already sent me a spreadsheet of. They have, you know, who's alive and who's not, um, where they're from, like just geographic, like zip codes, um, eight date of birth, um, and then also race, I think. They already have that, but I'm working on the IRB so I can get the full, you know, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm simultaneously also working on a qualitative study, designing that right now. Um, basically, what I'll be looking at is facilitators and barriers for getting palliative care in patients with, uh, with liver disease. Um, and I'll be interviewing hepatologists, palliative care providers, and then patients and caregivers as well down the line. Um, and then, you know, sort of um, in the next few years, my next goal would be to develop a focused intervention for this population. Questions? So what's so we didn't hear the results of the system review. Are you so you got it narrowed down to those eight, and now you're extracting? Is that where you're at? So I actually have that. I, I didn't necessarily go into each of the outcomes in terms of the direction of the outcomes here, but yeah, that all of that is done. We're working on. I have a table of you know all the results. We're working on the manuscript right now. So just off the top of your head, are there components of Interventions or referral, or your, do you have any big picture takeaway? Yeah, so um, so actually, you know, you could tell. Well, of course, the you know the first caveat is that they all have most most of them have high risk of bias. So you have to take the impact on outcomes with a grain of salt. Um, but um, actually, most of them show that um, there's a positive effect on the outcomes. Um, the survival, they show that there was no difference in survival. 
um, which I think that's very important because that's one of the barriers for palliative care and hospice is that people think that it's going to shorten your survival, things like that. Um, I think one, one of the studies looked at how long somebody was on hospice. So they showed that if somebody was on hospice less than one month, they actually had an increased healthcare resource utilization, like so more ER visits, things like that. But if they were on hospice for more than one month, it actually showed a decrease in utilization. Um, but you know, across the board, um, other than that study, um, most showed a decrease in healthcare resource utilization, and like I said, um, no effect on uh, survival. And the one study that looked at patient reported outcomes showed a decrease in depressive symptoms, um, as well as I think quality of life. Mm -hmm. So uh, the bar has been set kind of high, but I am a TL1 trainee, so I'm going to present a little bit of the preliminary work that I've done over the last two months, and my focus is going to be in the area of readmissions. So this time we're really switching gears to something um, a little bit more healthcare clinically associated. Um, so we are going to talk about the perspectives and how we can raise awareness and what the impacts of raising awareness um, and hospitalists are on readmissions. So readmissions is, I think, going to be the topic that I'm going to discuss with this group over the, over the next few months, in particular during my fellowship year. So I want to take a little bit of time right now to just kind of explain why I chose this. Um, my name is Naveed Farooq. I am a TL1 trainee. Um, I'm finished my third year uh, of medical school, so that now I'm under the mentorship of Dr. Kirsten Kennedy and Dr. James Willig of the Hospitalist Service and uh, School of Medicine, respectively. So, um, today I'm just going to start off by talking about uh, giving you a background, saying like why are readmissions in 2017 important. We're going to discuss the aims of what we hope to do. Um, we're going to tell you about our intervention as well as the outcomes that we're looking at, and then perhaps most importantly, I kind of want a little bit of feedback because we're still in the process of writing our IB and further designing um, our study. So. Readmissions have been a known problem. This began in the early 2000s when we realized that you know nearly one in five patients were returning to the hospital within 30 days. Now this number, I've given you a little bit of a sneak preview here, has been coming down, but there's still persistent challenges that we face. So the numbers that get thrown around is that same one in five number, but also a lot of money. This costs our healthcare system a tremendous amount. It also costs patients a tremendous amount in terms of lost work, in terms of caregiver time, in terms of emotional stress, as well as pain. So this is clearly a problem. We began addressing it primarily actually with the Affordable Care Act um, back in 2009. That actually instituted um, a hospital readmission reductions program and it instituted nationally, which is a good perspective because as we see here from the da Dartmouth Atlas Project, there's a lot of variation in readmissions. Um, there's some areas that had lower readmissions, um, a stretch over here if you can see, um, prim primarily in the Appalachian region, interestingly, with incredibly high readmissions. Now, just because these areas have lower readmissions, the conclusion isn't necessarily that they're doing better. Um, more so, that could be, be kind of confounded by their, their lack of access. Point to draw from here, though, is that there was a lot of variation, and I think generally in healthcare, when there's variation, there's room for improvement. So now, um, Medicare was a population that we were interested uh, that when this topic came up was interestingly first looked at because they had the great data show that, you know, whereas one in 20 for all cause um, readmissions in heart failure, it was nearly one in three patients that were readmitted. So within 30 days. So that kind of just stresses that, you know, it, it comes to a, uh, it comes to almost like a personal, maybe even a philosophical point that if we provide you care in the hospital, if you stay inpatient for a number of days, how many days should we expect that you can be discharged back out to the community, back out to a skilled nursing facility, and for how long can you um, stay healthy out there before you need to come back? Is that number 10 days? Is that number 30 days? Is that number 90 days? I think we've come to a somewhat conclusion that for our 30-day number, 30% 30 of people coming back just wasn't acceptable. And I think patients agreed with this too. 
So this hospital readmission reduction program, um, designed, as I said, through the Affordable Care Act, it was uh, passed in 2009. The penalties did not start until fiscal year 2013. And what they started by doing is they looked at a few targeted uh, diagnoses. So you see heart attack, heart failure, pneumonia, these were the largest drivers of readmissions. Now, as time has gone on, they've gone ahead and added new diagnoses and will continue to do so. So currently, right now, recently, they added hip and knee um, arthroplasty as well. So there's a little bit of modeling in addition, um, just on the number of hospitals that are penalized based on this criteria. And we see right now that estimates have shown there's about 75% of all hospitals in the U.S. will meet some form of penalty because of their uh, readmissions. I personally think, as well as a lot of people out there, that this is a little bit unacceptable. This clearly shows that there is a problem that we've begun to address, that we've kind of put into place the system that will address this, but that there's still a lot of work to be done. And just um, in terms of the actual number amount, it's about $500 million that hospitals and healthcare systems are, are losing year on, uh, and that attracts some research and other care um, investments that they can make. So. As a result of this program, luckily, you know, about 49 states have reduced their readmissions. So there, this has the, the system has incentivized us. And here's where, uh, taking into account the, uh, all the hospitals, we see this nice um, reduction right over here um, when the rule was confirmed and suddenly readmission reduction strategies began to be implemented. Now, I put a little bit of a dot here because we'll talk about it. We see this great drop, but then once the program's actually instituted in 2012, 2013, we're all of a sudden not seeing that same exact drop. This is maybe alluding to a little bit of the, the spike drop that we see initially. And so that's gonna be one potential where maybe we've hit some of the low hanging fruit in this issue, but maybe there's, we need to change up and be a little bit more innovative in the way that we tackle readmissions now. So just like, you know, there are lots of people that have reduced their admissions, there's the other side of the coin. So there are many, many of these hospitals that have been penalized. And I just put a little bit of a list from CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. These are some of the top hospitals that are also facing this penalty. This is not a penalty necessarily to uh, hospitals or systems that don't lack the resources. This is a very complicated problem that some of the, the most efficient healthcare systems are also struggling with. Fortunately, UAB is not on this list in 2017. So give ourselves a little pat on the back for, you know, we're doing something right. So um, Alabama itself had about 71 hospitals that were uh, penalized. Again, this is costing hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so this is still an issue. So what, what's been done? Like why, why have we seen those readmissions drop? Just for an example, you know, we have a discharge process improvement. A few of you guys that, uh, that work um, with clinicians or providers, you probably have seen there's new programs, there's texting interventions, um, there's greater vertical integration. So greater communication between primary care services and the actual uh, tertiary care center. So there's a lot of this, um, but yet at the same time, these penalties are given to hospitals. And healthcare systems have begun to argue that while yes, quality certainly plays a component in readmission, the social determinants of health, where you live, your zip code, play a, a substantial factor to readmissions. And that's where we really want to focus on because there's a paper that came out uh, just this year that essentially argued that the penalties that are being given, um, let, me, let me walk you through this first. So here's your index admission, um, your index hospitalization, here's the course of the hospitalization, and then you have readmission. Currently, CMS penalizes people um, on the quality of healthcare, but it does risk adjust. It risks adjust for a few comorbidities as well as age and gender. What this paper showed is that there are many, many other considerations in the social determinants of health that we need to take into account and that just risk adjust, just ooh, tongue twister, just risk adjusting on these few variables is not enough, and it's actually unfairly penalizing uh, healthcare systems. So they've used this work to show that really that the increased readmission, and they use a uh, large data set cohorts, um, they use CMS data primarily to show that actually um, ADLs, uh, a patient's uh, functional activities of daily living, were a great predictor and really impacted uh, whether they were readmitted or not um, 
irrespective of or independent of necessarily the quality of care that they got in the hospital. At the same time, cognitive impairment was good, then other things like having children actually protected them from readmission risk. And keep in mind, all of these factors are not accounted for and hospitals are penalized irregardless. Um, the, the thing being, if you live in an uh, area, let's say compare uh, New York versus some of the southeastern hospitals. Uh, the ADLs of the general population in New York, you could argue, would be slightly higher. They're a little bit more of an active population, say New York City specifically, versus perhaps in the southeast where we're not used to walking as much, we're a little bit functionally declined. That could be a driver in the readmissions talk because we've seen that functionality plays a huge role in readmissions. So back to kind of what we synthesized all along. The reason that in 2017 I want to look at this is because we had that great initial drop to start off with, with all the programs that seemed to make sense. You know, have a nurse call out to you to ask how you're doing. But at the same time, now after we've instituted these programs, some of the new initiatives we've been doing haven't so much seemed to work. At the same time, some, some data looking at how the number of initiatives that have needed to be instituted for, for outcomes to change has shown that on average people, not on average, but I should say people institute up to eight, nine interventions just to see some of their risk standardized scores or um, it's, a, it's a way to kind of compare what's an unplanned readmission to a planned readmission um, that it takes this many strategies for that number to actually start decreasing that just kind of points out to maybe there's a little bit of inefficiency going on. Maybe we should learn how to better predict and better target readmissions and how we, how we tackle them. And again, just in the back of our minds, this, there's a lot of money at stake here that, you know, um, that we could be using for other things. There's always, there's always a cost to, to these penalties, despite the fact that they are trying to incentivize better behavior. So um, specifically on the, on the physician perspective, so right now, um, physicians, the ones that are managing the, the discharge, little known about their insight into this new development of the social determinants of healthcare. So you would argue that if this is playing such an important role, you would want the discharging physician to understand the impact that this is playing. At the same time, like could their understanding and their awareness of truly the functional status of someone impacting their readmission actually go on to change readmissions? And currently, um, there, there's been one model out of Mayo that shows that directly telling patients about their readmissions has been shown to begin to decrease uh, readmissions. <laughs> so we actually took, um, concurrently alongside this Mayo model, my mentor, Dr. Kennedy, has set up an intervention uh, that does the same thing. It basically focuses on the hospitalists and gives them a way to know about whether their patients were readmitted or not. And so let's talk about what we're gonna do with that model. So we wanna do two things. We wanna first of all, just understand the baseline <laughs> perspectives of hospitalists regarding the preventability of readmissions. The second thing that we wanna do is that we want to see if raising awareness by telling them about the readmissions is gonna result first of all in a change in perspective, but then also ultimately, is it gonna result in a change in actual readmissions? So what is our intervention? Currently, um, there's no way to know if your patient was readmitted in, in the hospital service. You know, you discharge a patient, maybe you're on service, maybe you're not, maybe they get readmitted to a different service. So there's really not an understanding of whether are you discharging patients, is your readmit rate 10%, is it 1%, is it 30%? So what we're saying is that we have a, uh, an automated system to where whenever one of your patients, one of the patients that you discharge is readmitted, you will be sent a survey and you'll just spend a little bit of time reviewing the chart from your care period and then answering a few questions about why do you think this patient was readmitted and what could have been done to prevent the readmission. So for our measurement, we took, um, we took patients between that seven to 14 days. Um, that was a little bit arbitrary in the way that we uh, set it up. Um, question? Well, I have a question about the Oh, sure, sure. Sorry. Um, is that, do you, Hey, Mike, do we have time to do questions on the way? Sure. Or do you want to wait? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just thinking before you go on to sort of mm -hmm. measurement thing, just more conceptually. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you were going to draw a picture or a conceptual model mm -hmm. of why you think, you know, all the factors that have been studied and related mm -hmm. to readmissions, um, I'm wondering how large a chunk of that 
is driven by the perception of the discharging physician. Mm -hmm. And and I suspect it's modest. Right. Um, that doesn't mean they couldn't have an impact on the other things, but I, will you be able to not just look at what their perception may be, but also link it to any other piece of that component that they might be able to drive through heightened awareness? Because my suspicion is most physicians, even if they had an awareness about the readmission mm -hmm. uh, risk of their patients that they're seeing as an inpatient, mm -hmm. presumably, I'm not sure they would know what to do with that awareness. Right. So, so this is this is one project that we're doing in concordance with a few other where we're trying to identify essentially what are the gaps of, of what physicians think and then where can we kind of educate them so that, for example, um, if people don't understand that functional functionality is a huge component of it, therefore they might not contact social work or set up PT, OT um, to a certain degree. Right now we're kind of focused on the perspectives um, as we go on and really identify what do hospitalists or what does a discharging physician think is the most important factor, we want to take those things and introduce an intervention and see if that intervention therefore leads to a, a readmission uh, reduction. What do social workers think is the biggest? Yeah. That is a that is a good, good question. There's been some interdisciplinary qualitative uh, work, but I haven't really found too much uh, quantitative work. Um, there's been interdisciplinary um, qualitative where transitional care teams have been interviewed about readmissions, and that's been pretty promising. Out from that data is where um, some of the main themes of readmissions that I'll, I'll kind of get into the way that um, the themes of, of why readmissions are, are happening, that's where that has been developed from. So is it possible to look at retrospectively how many of the folks who are getting mm -hmm. multiple readmissions mm -hmm. didn't have? Because I... I'd be willing to place a, a big bet on the mm -hmm. fact that they are getting a social work consult, that right. they may be getting a rehab consult. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I guess where I'm going with this comment is I think we as physicians, but also as you know, thinking about it from the inpatient, tend to have kind of a myopic view of what we can control from the mm -hmm. inpatient place. And I'm, I'm thinking, is there a way to broaden this view a little bit to take mm -hmm. into account some of what happens outside the hospital? You know, because we're making the assumption that the discharging physician isn't doing X, Y, Z. And that might or might not be true. And we could probably ask that question. Along those lines, there was a recent paper in HSR published by Herrin, H-E-R-R-I-N. Yeah. That found that over 50% of the variation of readmission rates could be attributed to the county level. Mm -hmm. And so he found all of these things, for example, related to nursing home quality that were associated yeah. with readmission rates. Yeah, I've, I've seen that paper. That's uh, I don't know if I if I cited it specifically this one, but it was it was really interesting um, that that zip code played such a. But at the same time, a lot of that data um, is from admin level data. So one of the other projects that we're doing is focused on like a patient centered approach to that very data, um, asking patients about their access to primary care, asking patients um, about their socio demographic factors, uh, and a different approach to just admin level data. I think maybe the broader suggestion is thinking about mm -hmm. a broader conceptual model and thinking mm -hmm. about what drives readmission. And there's many frameworks you might apply. So there's going to be patient level factors, right. provider level factors, healthcare system level mm -hmm. factors, community level. I mean, so one might be ecological, but thinking about mm -hmm. thinking about some broader conceptual framework where the hospitals and provider is one piece, but thinking about it within this bigger picture. Because ultimately the goal is figuring out what is the relative contribution of your zip code of where you live and what that represents relative to what you do as an individual mm -hmm. to your healthcare team. So that it might be that some feedback and self-awareness has been shown to improve outcomes. So letting providers know here's how you're doing relative mm -hmm. to others, it might be a modest impact. But thinking about it within the broader context of those other factors, it just to help guide you. So not just right. for the next year, but the next okay. and. Okay. And I'll say, so this is this is one project that we're doing regarding readmission, so that, that kind of broader ecological focus is what we're doing in another project where we're focusing on the patient-centered factors. So and there's been work that's been done on the social determinants of health, but we feel that that even is, is not enough, that there's rather patient-level cognitive factors, the decisions that people are making about why they want to go to the hospital that's that's been unexplored, that really cannot be captured with like administrative-level data that you really do need to uh, talk to patients directly to kind of figure out. So that's the other component of, of this project 
that we're doing for right now, like I totally agree. We also thought that this effect would be modest at best, but we did feel that it would be it'd be worthwhile to investigate if this could happen, since it is a an easy fix to to be say, you know, to just institute awareness and just tell patients or set up a system where, hey, your patient was readmitted or to have just stats that, you know, um, you relative to others have greater readmissions in your practice. So um, another question, how do you have data about how many people who are readmitted are readmitted to UAB? Because, you know, if they go to St. Vincent's, you're not going to write that up. That's um, completely true. And That's... CMS does track that, right? Because mm -hmm. they're, they're tracking it, they're right. taking admissions back to the index hospital, even if they're going, you know, their next hospitalization mm -hmm. is, in, is in a different system. So the the thing um, about does that can that um, can that data be tracked on a I guess like a patient identification level because our our big issue with that is how would we access that data because we've thought about that but like remember we're doing this on like one one service so there'd be you know we have certain information about that. Um, and we haven't been able to use, say, the UAB EHR and link that to, I know um, UAB is, has a partnership with Vivo where they're doing something like that, um, but we haven't been able to access that data where UAB can see using Viva claims data where people are getting health care from. Um, I, I don't know if that's been documented in the literature. Um, you know, in terms of it would be possible to do, uh, to link it, say, if you're looking at Medicare, mm -hmm. you can link it to the CMS claims. Um, but probably not feasible for your PL1 project. Um, but if there, you know, if UAB has data, they they might have data because I think it would be in their, in, you know, in sort of the hospital system's interest to know are are we getting penalties for patients who are then going to, um, you know, you know, one of the other area hospitals. Right. Right. Um, so there there might be some information out there, so you can get a sense of like. Mm -hmm. Are you reporting a number that's accurate? Somebody may have had a question or comment for you on the uh, go to meeting to so the little the little orange box on the go to meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah. This one right here. Oh, very cool, Justin. I agree. Um, so, and health literacy is a is a really good point. That's something that uh, there's been a little bit of work on. Um, but like you're saying, like I don't think we've uh, interacted with the patient enough. And I think there needs to be more of like a quantitative uh, analysis on it. And there's just a barrier. There's a social barrier to doing that. You know, um, you have to be pretty objective in your uh, health literacy assessment. And that's actually a good point. I haven't seen too much work where people have quantitatively done that, more so qualitative projects that have described that this is an issue. Does that, uh, does that answer your question, Justin? You got any more input? Okay, they have a hard stop because it's a 9.30 meeting that's got to start, so oh, I yeah. maybe we just do another minute. And sure, then... sure. Yeah, so l let me go ahead and skip forward um, a little bit to uh, some of our preliminary um, data. This just kind of talks about our intervention, the characteristics of our services makeup. Um, this is an example uh, of the of the red cap survey. Um, so initially, we had about 332 readmissions, um, and most importantly in this is that 61% of the um, hospitalists said that the readmission is related to something that happened in the last readmission. So this is what they cited as their reasons for uh, readmission, um, and again. These are populated from the current literature that's out there, qualitative, quantitative studies, and yet still half of the, hosp the, half of the hospitals thought none of that really mattered. So we tried to drill down that other reason. Um, we found out that, okay, well, now we're going to introduce more of a social determinant focused reason for readmission, and yet still hospitals did not feel that that drove it very much. This uh, therapeutic misalignment is a, is a difference in, in understanding between the patient and the providers at that first hospitalization. So this is kind of our change in perspective. We saw some change in perspective, um, not significant right now, but um, this is over a 10 month period. Um, and overall, our readmissions have been reduced, but at the same time, over the 10 month period, is it just that you know readmissions reduced in October? So that's kind of our, our big thing that 61% that said it was related to initial hospitalization, and yet about 67% say that 
there's nothing that could have been done. So there's a mismatch there that I think is worth investigating. And we can kind of talk a little bit more about the future things. So the, the other complications that are happening, we're, we're taking um, all those things like the depression scales and we're asking patients directly. Right now, um, all of us you know, just draw from like massive amounts of CMS data things. And this is no one here's kind of like massive data depression score at all. And this is an example of what you can do with retrospective Right. Um, 